So this is uh, a work of a lot of people um, that are all listed here, if I can. Yeah. All right, so, that, so this is, uh, this, I'm just here basically as, as kind of uh, one of the authors of a large group of people. We've uh, basically tried to write a uh, an, uh, kind of a reassessment, revisitation, as it were, uh, of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, uh, kind of summarizing uh, a little more understanding that we have of, of this uh, statistical mode uh, that's been kind of gained over about the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, the paper is currently uh, in review in uh, Journal of Climate. <clears throat> so I'll just start with uh, kind of the conclusions. It's probably a good place to start in this talk, which is going to go by very fast. Uh, the, key, the key point here is that the PDO is not a physical mode. It's really a statistical mode. And as such, it really represents the sum of several different physical processes. Uh, stochastic forcing, essentially kind of a random fast forcing by weather noise, uh, and also uh, forcing uh, by ENSO via a mechanism called the atmospheric bridge, which also changes uh, Lucian low variability, obviously more on seasonal timescales. That drives changes in SST in the North Pacific. That's integrated by the ocean, so you actually redden uh, the effect of the forcing, and the reddening is strengthened by the fact that you have a reemergence process that actually brings anomalies back from winter to winter. Uh, but then in addition, there are uh, in strictly internal uh, North Pacific uh, uh, dynamics, uh, particularly variations in the uh, Carishio Oishio extension region in the Western uh, North Pacific. So that combination means that some aspects of the PDO, that SST anomaly, might act to force an atmospheric response, but quite a bit of the PDO is forced by the atmosphere, and therefore we need to distinguish uh, PDO correlated and PDO forced signals in the climate system. Models capture some of this, but in particular they have a, a very uh, definite deficiency in capturing the tropical uh, forcing of the North Pacific. Uh, and uh, as such, one needs to kind of keep in mind that you're trying to measure this multivariate system with one number, with one index, and that has uh, inherent limitations, which I'll try to discuss a little. All right, so this is what the PDO looks like. This is the definition of it. It's defined as the leading EOF of SST where the uh, monthly global mean SST is removed. That's important to keep in mind. So there's, it's an attempt to detrend the data in that respect. Uh, and you see the very typical pattern of uh, kind of cooling in the central Pacific, which is called the PDO positive uh, phase. Now, that's defined in the North Pacific, but in reality, it's uh, got worldwide uh, connections. So this is a regression of SST on the PDO index. And as you can see, it's not localized just to the North Pacific. Uh, there's a very obvious uh, ENSO component, and there are anomalies in the South Pacific uh, Indian Ocean and uh, in the Atlantic. So it's really kind of representing a global uh, pattern. And as uh, Clara noted on Monday, a lot of these patterns tend to look similar. If I do a regression off of ENSO, I'm also going to get a very, very similar looking pattern just with different, with different amplitudes. Uh, the time series of the PDO, however, as opposed to uh, ENSO, seems to have somewhat more of this decadal characteristic. There's this tendency for it to seem to stay in one sign for some period of time, uh, as you can see here, and then seem to switch sign fairly rapidly and stay in the other sign for some period of time. Uh, it's pretty robust. Uh, the, these uh, time series are, are not too different, uh, depending on which data set you use, uh, even uh, as far back as about 1920. And similarly, the patterns uh, from the different data sets are also uh, quite robust. And of course, the PDO is associated not just with ocean changes, but with worldwide climate changes, ecosystem changes, water resource changes. And so people have tried to correlate various things to the PDO and try to understand, could the PDO be forcing these sorts of things? And again, what we'd like to do is un get a, develop more of a process understanding of the PDO so that we could better understand uh, these uh, prediction and application issues. Now, you can get essentially a PDO, index, uh, PDO pattern fairly simply. Uh, here, uh, for example, one can run an AGCM coupled to a slab mix layer model. 
So the leading EOF of sea level pressure anomalies, the dominant pattern is basically an elution low variability, and that will, turns out, drive uh, SST anomalies uh, that look uh, something like the PDO, pretty close to the PDO. So this is a model, in fact, there's no ENSO, there's no currents, this is just only atmospheric coupling. And so just weather noise uh, variations alone will drive a PDO pattern. And that's basically happening because as you're changing the winds at the surface, you're changing surface fluxes. So typically you strengthen the winds. Uh, uh, if you strengthen westerly winds, you'll get uh, additional uh, latent heat fluxes, additional sensible heat fluxes, more cooling. Uh, also drive uh, Ekman uh, drift, which also turns out to drive cooling as well. Now, observationally, this is very easy to see. Uh, on the right, I'm showing a, a cross-correlation between the NPI, which is basically, basically a measure of the elution low. And essentially, that always leads the PDO. This is uh, something one sees very easily in observations, that atmospheric anomalies will precede the PDO. Uh, and that's, that's pretty clear here. Pretty much every month of the year, uh, so this kind of, this is just basically stratifying this cross-correlation by season. And similarly, you can see a pattern, uh, a PDO-like pattern, uh, if you look at, say, the elution low regressed or correlated with SST three months later. But we can also see that just in terms of ENSO. And so again, if we do the same sort of calculation but with an ENSO index, ENSO also leads uh, the PDO uh, throughout the year. Uh, and again, there's this pattern of, uh, of uh, ENSO uh, correlated leading the SST uh, in, uh, in the North Pacific. So basically what's happening here is you have an ENSO uh, anomaly here, and typically a couple months later, you're seeing the PDO response as, the, as ENSO drives changes in convection, drives changes into the exotropics, and then hence drives changes in the uh, surface winds in the North Pacific. I think, did I skip a slide? I can't. Yeah, okay. All right, but like I said, in addition, there are ocean processes which are actually driving uh, enhanced integration. So although the, the uh, mix layer is acting to integrate the forcing, uh, that would only give you a time scale of, on the order of months. But in reality, uh, the uh, time scale is really more on the order of years, and that's because of this reemergence process, which you can see uh, here uh, computed from uh, aura data in uh, three different locations. So we basically correlated PDO uh, to uh, the ocean temperatures. So we're looking at uh, wintertime PDO and just seeing how the ocean temperatures evolve. So if you look in the central, uh, the center picture, basically what you see is a PDO uh, the, um, the forcing is driving a, a deep mix layer anomaly in the winter. And then as you go into the summer, you get the shoaling of the mix layer. So the anomaly stays below the surface, but it, it's basically decoupled from above. And then uh, as a result, the following uh, winter, when the mix layer deepens again, that anomaly comes back up. Uh, through This is what's called reemergence, basically a remixing of the water. And so the anomaly comes back after a year. And in fact, you can see here uh, in observations that, that this process uh, occurs for a second year. So this, this reemergence is tending to bring back that anomaly for a couple of years. And that obviously means the ocean is doing a substantial amount of integration of forcing on it by the atmosphere, either through weather noise uh, or through ENSO. And if you look at the PDO autocorrelation, you actually can, can kind of see this. Uh, in, uh, in observations as well, there's this tendency to have these kind of ridges in the autocorrelation, essentially whenever you're correlating with a succeeding spring. So correlations are typically high from a particular PDO looking forward to springs. So the correlation will be a maximum from spring to spring, but if you go, say, from a particular time into summer or fall, the correlation basically uh, drops to zero. So it's very uh, definitely tied to the seasonal cycle and that's a result of this reemergence process. In addition, uh, we can also have just an internal variability where uh, basin-wide uh, wind systems are acting to drive oceanic Rossby waves that propagate westward. And these take a couple of years uh, to propagate to the western boundary. 
which can be seen in this figure here. These are essentially sea surface height. So you're seeing this propagation occurring on a couple of year time scales, and it's associated with uh, SST anomalies in the Western Pacific. And these patterns are not the same as a PDO pattern, but they project on the PDO pattern. And in fact, that's true for all these processes. They're all predict producing SST patterns that are similar to, but not identical to, the PDO EOF. They all project on it. Now, in atmospheric models, it's always been a question of whether the atmosphere might respond to these SST anomalies and uh, basically driving shifts in this, in the Oyashio current here in the uh, Western Pacific. And uh, it, it may well be that this is a resolution issue. Uh, we've done uh, some runs where uh, when we increase the resolution of the atmospheric model to a quarter degree, we get a, a, a much different response to these SSC anomalies because the synoptic eddies uh, storm track actually is, uh, is now resolved well enough that changes in heat fluxes appear to be captured. So it's possible that there is some uh, atmospheric response to this part of the SST anomaly. So again, that's something to keep in mind. The PDO, although it's largely forced by the atmosphere, it's not only a response. It could uh, act as some forcing, but the question is how and how much. All right, so we're going to try to put all of this together, and, and the way we, we're using here is a, uh, is a statistical model, uh, basically called a linear inverse model, and it's essentially just a multivariate extension of an AR1 uh, model. So rather than thinking of a univariate time series with a, a single number here, this X now represents an entire map. So the entire SST map and maybe heat content map and winds is essentially the state vector of the climate system in some truncated form. Here it's very truncated because I'm only using uh, SST. But when one does this, one can get this uh, operator uh, from the observations, from the lag covariability, in just the same way you would do a univariate uh, a, uh, analysis. But the difference is, is that this, this operator now, uh, the eigenmodes of this operator represent uh, different dynamical patterns with different dynamical time scales. So you can kind of see that here. I'm not going to go into all the details of how this is done. But these are, apart from a kind of a trend-like pattern, um, these are the leading, in terms of the least damped, the slowest evolving uh, patterns, and you can see you get a, oh, I don't want to do that. Okay. You get on the top, you get a pattern which looks uh, somewhat like this, this North Pacific structure that I was talking about earlier, and you can see that has a very slow uh, evolution. And then there are different components that are essentially like a Central Pacific and so uh, Eastern Pacific and so it's really the combination of these different and so eigenmodes which give kind of the full uh, and so diversity uh, that we observe. And you can see the time scales, the uh, time series associated with each of these in terms of the projection uh, of the PDO uh, on these patterns. So now if you just take these three, in reality, uh, there are obviously there are more modes in the system, but I'm just going to try to, to simplify it into just these three. And if you add these together, you can get kind of a PDO reconstruction. These uh, little vertical green lines, by the way, are times that people talk about as, as regime shifts of the PDO. And we can compare that uh, to the observed PDO, and the correlation is basically about 0.8. So here what we're getting then is we are taking a number of different patterns, where the patterns are similar, they're not, or, they're not orthogonal, God. they're not orthogonal, <clears throat> but they have very different uh, time evolution. So you can think of each pattern as representing a different univariate red noise process, and we're just summing these up to make a multivariate kind of red noise uh, system. But as you add uh, univariate red noises together, you can generate processes that will get fairly rapid regime shifts. Uh, so in fact, uh, this is a, a fairly well-known result, I guess, in, in econometrics, that you get 1 over F noise uh, in a system with certain interesting nonlinear processes, or if you just add up uh, a very large number of univariate red noises with different decorrelation timescales. And that uh, seems to be at least a plausible explanation uh, for uh, PDO regime shifts here. So we can take a look at the, uh, the well-known 76 uh, regime shift. Uh, 
So I've got the PDO index down there again. And you can see uh, the 76 regime shift. We're just going to look at what the pattern uh, looked like. So we take the 20 years before 76, subtracted from the 20 years after 76, and the SST pattern is shown there. It's, uh, it's kind of the classic, it's the well-known uh, PDO regime shift pattern. So was that a coherent North Pacific regime shift? Well, if you remember, one of the, the uh, eigenmodes uh, that evolved very slowly, it actually had a transition more around 68, 69. So I'm doing the exact same calculation, but just centering on 69. And now I get a very different pattern. And in fact, in the North Pacific, I'm getting a larger amplitude. And in fact, it seems to be more related to the Atlantic. So it, it's clear, again, that it, it's hard to talk about 76, 77 as some sort of global climate regime shift based on, on looking at one tropically-based uh, index uh, changing sign. It's clear that different things are going on at different times. In other words, we're adding these different processes which have different evolutions, and they can line up for a particular index at a particular time and give a fairly rapid uh, shift, but that's partly an artifact of choosing an index uh, and if, as opposed to, say, looking at the, uh, the global pattern. Now, obviously, if ENSO is a large comp uh, contributor to uh, the PDO, you might expect that what PDO skill you have is going to either come from ENSO or be limited by ENSO. And in fact, I would argue that it's mostly limited by ENSO. So here what I'm showing is the uh, Heincast skill of, of a number of the different uh, uh, CM5 uh, Heincast models compared in the bottom left to uh, a similar Heincast from, again, from this kind of statistical model. Now this is a global one. And you can see with those yellow circles at the one place where there's low skill, whether you're looking at a full GCM or this empirical uh, model, is in this tropical northeast Pacific area. And of course, one of the problems here is you're trying to predict ENSO on a two to five or six to nine year time scale. ENSO is not predictable on these time scales. To that extent, ENSO then acts as noise, not just in the tropical Pacific, but then again in the Northeast Pacific. So it'll be difficult then to, to make a PDO kind of forecast. All right, so I'll try to do this real quickly because I don't have too much time. So this is the summary of what I'm going to show. Basically, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how the PDO looks in climate models and paleo reconstructions. And the key points here is that while most CMIT-5 models have a recognizable PDO pattern, they tend to underestimate the connection to the tropics, and uh, they're uh, somewhat overestimating uh, the North Pacific internal uh, variability. Um, and paleo reconstructions uh, also have uh, similar sorts of problems. So here's a Taylor diagram comparing the PDO pattern uh, in all the uh, CMIT-3 and CMIT-5 uh, 20th century runs. Uh, and also in comparison, these little black dots, if I can show them here, are, uh, are essentially recomputing the PDOF from the, the data set, but just doing 50-year subsamples or kind of a bootstrapping. And the little triangles are the PDO from the other uh, three SST data sets I'd shown earlier. So they're all kind of within this sampling uncertainty, but basically the models are all well outside of it. So essentially, no model is really reproducing uh, the PDO EOF. They have PDO-like uh, patterns, I think is probably a, uh, is a better way to put it. And that may be at least in part because of this uh, issue uh, of the connection to the tropics. So we can do a kind of simpler uh, AR1 model uh, shown on the top here where we're doing a regression on uh, tropical uh, EOF1 and then EOF2, which is more this east-west uh, kind of ENSO pattern, uh, and, then, and having an autocorrelation uh, R for, uh, for uh, the time series. And the ob observations are, are in the red on the right. So if you look particularly on this second uh, plot here, you can see that in that almost all of the models, with one or two exceptions, and they, they have their own uh, interesting uh, behavior and variability, but almost all of the models, the correlation uh, to, to ENSO is too low. So models typically underestimate the tropical relationship to the North Pacific. So that can give, tend to give kind of a false impression sometimes if you use a model to try to investigate the PDO, you may think that you've got something which has got more internal dynamics or dynamics that's unrelated to the tropics, but in reality, that's because the models are not able to re recapture this kind of behavior. Um, 
<clears throat> and we can also take a look at the, uh, the spectra. So again, we can use this multivariate AR1 model now as a null hypothesis in just the same way that a univariate uh, red noise is typically used as, as a null hypothesis. So in all three of these, I'm putting the observed spectra on. It's the black line uh, here, or the black, there's four black lines. They're all obviously very close together, uh, right in the center there. And then these kind of, this gray shaded region with the thinner black line uh, boundary is essentially this, this multivariate AR1 null hypothesis. And you can see how all the models kind of lie uh, within it. The reconstructions uh, typically uh, are too weak. Okay. Um, and again, you see this kind of uh, spectral slope behavior of the, uh, of the PDO. You're not seeing so much significant peaks, really, in the observations as a slope in the spectrum. Again, that's characteristic of this, this kind of one over F, this uh, one over F noise process, which again could be a result of the summation of these different uh, processes uh, with different time scales. So I think I'll just uh, end on this uh, bottom panel. So we can then look at the paleo reconstructions and say, well, how do they do uh, uh, compared to each other? And essentially, um, there's almost no agreement prior to the instrumental records. So they all agree very well, obviously, after about 1950, but prior to 1950, there's very little uh, agreement. The gray shading is kind of indicating a kind of a percent common variance explained. And in the bottom panel, I'm showing a 20-year smoother, so it's uh, even more obvious uh, that, that all these uh, reconstructions basically can have opposite signs for, for potentially big PDO events. So you can use these PDO reconstructions to say pretty much whatever you want, depending upon the, the reconstruction you pick. So there are, there are a number of, of, of possible reasons for why this could be, why they could disagree so substantially, uh, having to do with various sorts of processes in terms of tree room reconstruction uh, and so forth. But I would suggest that there may be a, a more fundamental problem here, because these are all uh, coming, these reconstructions are based on sites in different locations. And these different locations may be sensitive, essentially, to different parts of these PDO processes. So they're not really seeing the same PDO pattern. So they're getting trained on a PDO index, but you know, one location may be essentially sensitive to tropical forcing, which is simultaneously forcing a response, say, in the west coast of North America and the North Pacific. Uh, and another. Uh, um, site might be in a place where maybe it's more sensitive primarily to weather noise and another may be sensitive to a place which actually is responding to some forced SST response coming from the Kurashio. And that mix uh, may make these reconstructions uh, very difficult to, uh, to make consistent so long as they're being trained on a single index. All right, so. All right, so I'll just kind of uh, conclude there. Essentially, uh, this is sort of a, a summary slide, as it were, of these various uh, mechanisms. And this just leaves us with a couple of implications in terms of how do you use something like the PDO. And I, I would argue that this is, 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 is probably true uh, for other areas. Maybe this is true for the Atlantic as well. Trying to differentiate between the, the forced response and location, if you're interested, not just in predicting the ocean, but in predicting ocean effects uh, on uh, land, you would like to differentiate between those effects that are forced by the ocean and those effects that are simultaneously uh, forced by some atmospheric variability which is also forcing the ocean. Uh, separating that out, I think, is, is, a, is a much harder problem than, than maybe has been, uh, people have been willing to deal with so far. And a lot of this is coming about because we're uh, used to trying to treat these, these much more complicated systems with a single index, with one number, uh, and that has inherent limitation, limitations which can also give rise to some behavior uh, such as regime shifts, which may be more an artifact of using one index than a true representation of the climate system. So I'll stop there. Thank you.